everybody, it's Vanessa E from the Streamate Network, and I am super excited because today I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with the author of Happy Starts at Home, a book that explores how our living spaces play a direct impact on our lives and our overall well beings. She's been featured on Bustle, Seattle Magazine, as well as the Washington Post, among others. She is also a design psychology coach, okay, and interior designer, as well as the owner of Seriously Happy Homes Design Firm, which is based in Seattle, Washington. I'm super pleased to welcome Rebecca West. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, so a little backstory. Um, you and I were supposed to actually get together this month, um, but given the circumstances with stay at home and COVID-19, we are using the miracle of live streaming technology to connect. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this. Of course, I'm just so glad we have the technology so we can keep doing this. Yeah, and it's it's actually pretty good technology. I'm really impressed by like what the mainstream world is doing with live streaming <laughs> as well. <laughs> Give us a little bit of background about how you got your start with um, design psychology coaching and how exactly is it that you assist individuals with um, getting into alignment with their living spaces. Absolutely. So my story is that 13 years ago I got divorced and I was living in a house that I had once shared with my ex-husband and he moved out, but the memories didn't, right? There was the paint color we chose, the bed we shared, the, the sofa that his you know, parents had given us. Uh -huh. And I felt so trapped in that space because I was surrounded by my past and, and that past was now connected to this failure of my marriage. So it felt awful. Yeah. And I had to make over my own space on a freshly divorced woman's budget with no career. Um, but I did. And it was so transformative for me because I literally went from looking at my past to, to like seeing the possibility, seeing the future. And since I wasn't doing anything else at the time, because I'd quit my job teaching ballroom dance to try and work on the marriage, oh. I said, I'm going to start a business. And, you know, that's ridiculous. It should never have worked. But it did, and 13 years later, now I have a book called Happy Starts at Home and a firm where we you know, design remodels and all kinds of fun things. And the book is really where we talk about design psychology. You know, is your home working for you or is it working against you? Which really relates back to my story of feeling like my home was totally working against me. And then the design firm is really about the execution of that. Like, okay, you figured out you need to make a change, let's make a, a create a plan, a physical plan for how that change is going to come about. Wow. So that all kind of organically happened then beginning with something that maybe people would perceive as an unfortunate circumstance, but really something really good came out of it for you. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's true with almost every earthquake that happens in our life. You know, every time we're, we're challenged or stressed, it's an opportunity to grow and create a new opportunity. Most of us don't grow and create opportunities when things are going well, right? Things are going well, so you just kind of, you write it. Yeah. When we're under challenging circumstances is when we discover how strong we are and what we can do with that. So um, I wanted to talk to you today and I'm super excited to pick your brain because, um, you know, we've obviously, our, our industry is live camming. Um, and although we are under stay at home orders at this present moment in time, people have been uh, camming and working from home in our industry for quite some time, even before all of this happened. But more recently, we've seen just this huge influx of people who are coming into live cams, coming into live broadcasting, and they are working from home. So they're getting acclimated to their own work environment for one, as well as a new schedule. Um, so I was hoping to utilize some of your knowledge to give some uh, people who are new to the camming industry um, or working from home in general, just general insight as to how they can comfortably do that from their own living environments. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it because this stuff is universal. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're working from home, there are good practices and there are bad practices. And it's especially interesting when you're working from home and you're inviting people into that space. You know, right now I'm in my home space. I have to think about, even as an interior designer, what's behind me? What am I creating for my participant? Um, so that's true in any industry. 
yeah, it's a whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes so much further beyond just the actual performance aspect. There's so many little details to think about. Um, so I guess we'll start our conversation off with how are the environments that we create linked to our emotional state of mind and our emotional health overall? Well, in my opinion, they are completely linked. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, for me, I, and for the clients who resonate with this message, what we see around us is either making us feel more calm or more chaotic, right? When we have a lot of chaos around us, sometimes it's actually a reflection of inner turmoil and inner chaos that we're feeling because when we start feeling really low about ourselves, we too tend to neglect the things around us. And so if we're seeing a lot of external chaos, it might be because it's a reflection of what we're feeling and we're feeling um, an inability to take care of ourselves and our surroundings. Other times we're actually doing okay mentally, but because of circumstances, things get out of control. Right? We don't have enough time to keep things tidy or, or, um, up to date or repaired. And then over time that takes a toll because now you're like, is this, you know, why am I working so hard? Why am I living in this environment? Is this as good as I am? Is this as good as it gets? And then even if we started out in a good place, it can really start to wear on us, especially when we work from home and that surrounding is all we see. And it can really, really get frustrating. I can totally relate to that right now. <laughs> Behind those closed doors, there's like baskets of laundry. <laughs> but that totally hits home, especially right now because of circumstances. And But I think in general, too, it's so easy to get caught up in just how busy we, we are or, or projects that we're chasing, um, deadlines. And so it's really easy to neglect our environment. And yeah. yeah. Which is okay for a minute. But if it happens over the long term, it will, it will take a psychological toll. And what, I'm, what I want for people is the opposite of that. So instead of thinking, yeah, okay, I can neglect it and maybe long term it's gonna make me feel badly. The opposite of that is if you take care of your environment, it will take care of you. You come home to, or you are, are home in a space that lifts you up and makes you feel focused and in control and just honestly just makes you smile and makes you happy. So I always say that our space is, it's not neutral. It's either bringing us down or it's lifting us up. And we want to be active, proactive, and make sure that it's lifting us up. And thinking about what we need from our space. This is not about trends and this is not about like design rules. There are certain things that make a space work better or not as well. But it's really about searching inside of yourself and going, what do I need from my space? Not with what would my sister need if she lived here. This isn't her place. This is your place. What do you need? Okay. So in terms of finding a separation then between our work and our home lives, um, why is it important that we do that in your opinion? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, <laughs> one, because your brain needs to know which mode it's in, right? Our work brain and our just relaxing and being chill brain are not the same. And we need those cues for which mode you're, I'm, you know, I need those cues for which mode I'm supposed to be in because it's just, it, it lets you rest. You, if you don't know, okay, this is the time when I can rest, when I can recharge, and this is the time when I need to be on and, and giving and putting my energy out, then it just gets all smooshy and you're never fully on when you're at work and you're never fully off when you're resting. Yeah. I, I, man, it's like I'm in a therapy session or something. <laughs> Seriously, these are hitting home so hard. And I think, but I, I, at the same time, I don't feel like my struggle is unique by any means. I think a lot of people um, are definitely constantly battling with trying to maintain that balance between work and home life. So, and just from your experience too, um, maybe give us a few ways that we can effectively find that balance between the two. Yeah, and this, it's especially challenging when you work from home, right? So if you get to leave the house and go to work and come home, it's much easier to separate the work and home life. Although you still have to be careful because a lot of people bring their work home, either the actual work or just the emotional you know, work and the baggage of it. Yeah. But when you work from home, you have to be a lot more intentional about creating that separation. So obviously, if you live in a large enough space, the easiest thing to do is have rooms that are for work and rooms that aren't for work. 
Um, so, but not everybody has that luxury. Some of us live in smaller spaces. So if you have to combine your workspace and your, and any other space, whether it's your living room or your bedroom, but especially if it's your bedroom, you have to find ways where you're going to separate the time. Maybe that's through a ritual. Maybe you light a certain candle or play certain music or have certain new bedding on the bed when it's work time. And, and then you put that away. You physically stop those things when that time is over. Um, or you just literally put the work away. When I worked, when I started my company, my desk was a tiny little nook in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I just made sure that all of my paperwork was put away. My computer was off at the end of the day so that when I went to bed at night, I wasn't staring at the to-do list. I wasn't staring at work. So there's lots of ways to go about it. It'll depend on what room you're working from and what separation you need but it's very important to figure out how to create that separation. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to take a, a whole room transformation every single day. <laughs> yeah. um, so much of this is psychological, you know, the, the small cues that say, I am now at work. So that could just be a change in the comforter, or it could be um, that certain pieces of art swap around for on-cam versus off-cam time, or like I said, just lighting a can candle. It doesn't have to be huge to make that psychological difference of separating the spaces, if you will. Um, on the other hand, it can be. You can say, you can set up rules for yourself. You don't even have to be in your bedroom, right? You can say, my bedroom is off limits. Or if you have a guest room, this room is for filming. This room is for sleeping. Mm -hmm. There's just, it, it depends on your space. But the key is think outside of the rules or the box you think you might be in and um try some things um i think is that is it like 60 days or i heard like 21 days but then as long as like 60 days to develop like a new habit or adapt a new routine so would you say then like if if someone were to just designate like this one favorite candle of theirs and once they light it then they, they get into work mode they just need to continue to practice and be consistent with like lighting that that candle or doing that one thing every single day and eventually their mind will catch up. It does take some cues, right? So you may need to, when you're trying to build a new habit of any kind, create some false um, structure around that, you know, big old post-it note on your door that says, you know, hey, light your candle. <laughs> you're not going to remember it at first. Yeah. Um, unless it's something very, very pleasurable because ideally it is creating pleasure around these things too. The ritual should be something you like. So, you know, if you're bringing a big, wonderful faux fur onto your bed for camera time, hopefully that sensuality is something you're craving and it makes work a pleasure separate from how non-work is a pleasure. Right. And when you're done, then you can easily just put it away. And that's how you find those boundaries. What is your advice on creating a happy space that would also inspire, inspire people to show up for work each and every day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, long work hours are a struggle no matter who you are and where you are. Um, and especially with physical work, like it takes a toll. Yeah. Um, but so <laughs> my favorite thing is clean, refresh, right? Don't let things get out of control like we were talking about earlier. Maybe you have an end of day or end of work week cleaning ritual so everything just gets vacuumed and dusted and scrubbed down so you feel like the, light, the room is still alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you could even bring um, some life into the room with plants and flowers and things that say, this room has living energy, open the windows, get the air moving. Then in the design of the space, paint the walls colors that you love. Um, make sure that the textures of things that you're sitting on and touching are things that you want to sit on and touch. And just don't have anything in your room. And this is true, this is my, my number one rule. Don't have anything in the room that makes you feel badly or connects you to old relationships or old stories, things that you just don't like. Mm -hmm. um, life is too short to be surrounded by that, especially for 40 hours a week. Do you think that then like those things that maybe have a, a negative association that we might still be keeping around, for instance, you know, past relationships, articles of furniture, um, do those things carry that heavy of an energy to them in your opinion? Um, even just having a simple little uh, tchotchke, you know, from a, from a previous relationship, does that 
really weigh on our minds as much, like even to a degree that we don't, we're not even aware of? I, I would say yes. And I'm saying that both from my own experience. You know, when I got divorced, I sold my queen bed that we had shared and I got myself a twin bed because I was like, this is a bed for one person. Nobody's invited. Um, and that was yeah. a way for me to exercise control and for me to say, this space is now about my new chapter, not my old chapter. Um, but I had a client once, I was having a, a quick one and a half hour session with her, talking through her space. And we identified that the bookcase that was at the end of her bed was from an old relationship. She's like, I've never liked it. I didn't even like it when you lived here. I still don't like it, but it's always seemed practical or functional. So in, through our conversation, it kind of gave her permission to put it on the street and give it away for free on Craigslist. And she said that it just was like a whole weight lifting off of her shoulders. You know, she went to bed every night with this totem of this past relationship looming over her. Yeah. We aren't always aware of the feelings that come from these pieces, but as we become aware, it can be remarkable how heavy they are. Now, it doesn't always mean you have to get rid of your furniture. Sometimes the budget doesn't allow you to just buy a full suite of furniture. But small changes can make a big effect. Fresh bedding, uh, you know, new handles or hardware, painting the bed, the headboard, making a new color, um, and going a little woo-woo, you know, sage the heck out of the room, whatever. <laughs> but be intentional yeah. and don't let it control how you're feeling. Actually, I... Um a previous um, separation as well, I kept a lot of the furniture from that time. And only recently did I start to sell those things off or I just gave things away. And you're right, it does make a really big difference with just cutting loose those old memories. And I wasn't even really associating it with that relationship, but I just ha so happened to have those things around. And once they weren't there anymore and I, I got new things, it really did like lift up my energy in a in a strange way, that's it's hard to explain, but yeah, I felt like re-energized just from having new things around. And it's amazing, you know, if you got some of those longer relationships, how long little things just linger around your house, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd, I think for 10 years, even as intentional as I was with my space, for 10 years, I would find surprise things that suddenly just brought back that flood of memories and the anxiety around my divorce. And, and so each time I would come across the new thing, you open a drawer and you're like, what the heck, right? Um, and then I would get rid of it or goodwill it or, or whatever. Every time I did, I would just feel a little bit lighter and a little bit renewed and a little bit more the new me instead of the old me. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the cam world, you know, whenever so much of your energy is being put into interacting with people online and your actual performances, um, there is, there isn't really much leeway for, any kind of energy zappers like that that might be lingering. So it, exactly. sounds, it sounds like eliminating those from your direct cam space in particular um, would also be very helpful. Yeah, and it's just a matter of doing what you can, right? If this conversation sparks an idea for somebody and all they can do is maybe, you know, change the bedding from an old relationship, that's enough. It doesn't have to be a grand house makeover. What, it, what will happen is just like building a new habit, you will get a little bit of momentum. You'll change one small thing and then it will be just, it'll be just a little easier to change the next small thing. But I can't imagine, um, you know, having somebody so intimately in your space, which as a performer, you have, you know, dozens, hundreds, I don't know, people in your space. And, and if you have a bad day at work, that's still in your space once you turn off the camera. So you have to find ways to, to separate those two worlds and say that, you know, I had that, that was in this space where I just was at work, but now work is over and I'm going to reclaim my space. And those people are not in it anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that was so amazing what you just said. It's nice to be able to work from home, but at the same time, there are harder days like that where maybe people online aren't the kindest to you um, or you just have a bad day in general. So um, for, for a lot of people, I think it's really easy to allow themselves to become consumed with those feelings and kind of stay in it. 
so that the next time they enter that cam space, I don't know, it's just kind of, it's that ickiness is still kind of lingering there. So I really love what you said about, you know, turning off the camera and then just turning everything off from there. I think that's really sound advice. Yeah, and the thing to realize is this work, it's different in that it's stigmatized culturally. Yeah. But it's a job like any other. So having bad days is normal. Having stupid clients is normal. And you do have to find a way to say, yeah, but I'm not at work anymore. Yeah. So, you know. And then go on and live your life, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so what are some factors then that would indicate an incompatible home or work environment? Well, if you are having trouble separating that work and, and, and non-work time, if you feel like, you know, should I, I mean, sort of like when people are like at home and then the phone chimes and like, oh, I should answer that. Well, should you? Are you at work or are you not at work? So is your space making you feel like you're still at work even when you're not? That probably suggests that it's a bit incompatible. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do I just... Did I just press the button for you? I'm self-conscious over here. Okay. Okay. All of us, you know, I'll just answer one more email is something my husband hears from me a lot. <laughs> um, and then, you know, speaking of husbands, if, you, when, if your family doesn't know, doesn't have cues for, oh, they're at work, they're not at work. Because if you are asking your family to be respectful of time when you're at work, um, they need to be able to know you know, the door is closed or the, the candle's lit or whatever your, your cues are so that you're not having relationship problems where you're going, I was at work and they're like, but I didn't, how was I supposed to know that? You know, can you emotionally separate yourself, work and life space? Can your family also separate what's work time, what isn't work time so that they're honoring you as a professional, but also getting to have human time with you as well? We need to be intentional and make the effort to continue to separate those things too, because it's really easy for things to, to bleed, like our work life to bleed into our home lives or into our relationships, mm -hmm. right? Yep, and the more we work from home, the harder it is to make those distinctions. And that's why we have to be that much more in charge of that intentionality. So we're gonna switch over to the more of the marketing side of things. Um, so, Viewing the site, this like Streamate or any cam site, um, performer profiles are organized so that you might have as many as like a hundred performers on when when someone is viewing the page, um, and even less so if someone is on a mobile device. So you have milliseconds to really just grab that that viewer's attention, and essentially the goal is to have them enter the room and interact with you. Mm -hmm. um, so what elements should we be focusing on when it comes to creating an eye-grabbing and a visually pleasing cam environment that stands out amongst others? Yeah, and this is just, you know, good branding 101, right? So you want to think about what kind of environment are you trying to create? What kind of environment are, are, is going to appeal to your client, right? So when I, so I'm a business coach as well, and when I work with my coaching clients, frequently they're trying to be really generic. I want to appeal to everybody. Well, that doesn't work because then you appeal to nobody. So with any kind of business, you have to decide what kind of client am I going to be targeting? And then, okay, great. What are all the elements that go with that? You know, am I creating a very glam, luxurious effect with my space and my performance and my body and my clothes? All of those things should go together. And so if I'm thinking glam, then I'm going to be thinking bold colors, big scale artwork. You're not going to have a lot of clutter. You're not going to have toys sitting around. By that, I mean like stuffed animals, you know, I have other toys. Um, <laughs> but you're going to be thinking what kind of a, a movie set am I creating that supports the persona that I want to be? that you know, luxury, and, luxury and glam is very different from wholesome girl next door. Mm -hmm. And that one might actually have stuffed animals in the room. I don't know, right? <laughs> but in general, good design is about getting scale and contrast right. You don't want lots of tiny little things. It just looks like clutter. It looks dirty. It looks disheveled. You want fewer, bigger things so the eye can take in the story very easily. But what I recommend is think past the cam world and just go watch sitcoms and stuff 
and look at the environments that are created to support the storyline because that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you are your own little movie set. Mm -hmm. So go watch some of the shows that might even align with the vibe you're trying to create. And then don't watch the actors, watch the environment. What do the doors look like? What are the colors are on the walls? What are the little accessories that are around that are setting that vibe? Um, it's, it is quick, but it's all psychological. Yeah. So it really comes down to then just kind of knowing how you're brand going to be branding yourself then. Does it need to necessarily go to the extremes as far as branding goes? Like say I am just, I just want to be the girl next door, but then you, you kind of have to really um, put an exclama exclamation point on that when it comes to the design of your room in order to get your point across and for viewers to really understand who you are. You, you have to decide if you want your real life persona to align with your cam per persona. If you, if you have a big house, you can make one room that's just, you know, Vivian Vixen and in real life, you're just, you know, Pamela. Mm -hmm. But in, for most of us, we have smaller spaces. And so you need to have a bedroom that you feel comfortable sleeping in as well as performing in. So I do think aligning your, your real life personality will make it easier to keep those two worlds clear. Um, but for some people, keeping those two worlds clear is about creating a very different persona. And maybe it's not that it's not who you are, but it's maybe it's a side of who you are. Um, for a while, I was a burlesque performer very briefly, and I was a sexy clown. It was, it was terrifying, <laughs> according to many people. But I love costumes. For me, the joy of performing was in the costume. So to have performed like this as me would have been kind of like, a letdown. I wanted that larger than life experience while I was performing, but it was still part of me. Okay, so to circle back to the question, um, yes, you, you, you get to decide how much of yourself you're revealing, but in the end, it is an amplified version of yourself. Um, when, to, to go to another personal example, when I was teaching ballroom dance, our job was to create some level of fantasy for our clients when they came in to learn from us, right? So we were ourselves, but we were the best version of ourselves. We didn't burden our clients with the sadness of our day. You know, we just shared the joy of dancing and of touching another human being and of moving together. And the humor that goes with trying to move as two bodies at one time, which is ridiculous. Um, so that's, we are performers and, and that is going to have that exclamation mark. And if you are taking your business seriously, you do have to clear away some of the clutter that doesn't support the brand. If you're trying to get somebody to instantly get the brand. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. So I guess if for a lot of people, that kind of branding in my mind will only come with a little bit of time because sometimes yeah. you really sign up for it and you just don't really know exactly what your brand is or like what your niche is or what you like and what you don't like so absolutely yeah. and again true across every single industry when you have a brand new interior designer they're like i don't know i just want to design rooms for people <laughs> yeah but that get that is very generic and if you were to go to a networking event and say i'm an interior designer who designs rooms for people there's nothing there to make people go, oh, I have to remember that. But if you were to say, I specialize in spaces for um, older people who are downsizing and want a safe space so that they can live comfortably for the next 20 years, that's very specific. And people will go, I know exactly who my mom needs to work with. Mm -hmm. So any industry, at first, you're just going to be like, I don't know, I'm going to go on cam today and do some stuff. But over time, if you want to get known, you have to be known for something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My final question then for this segment, when it comes to the psychology of color, how can performers apply this to their work environment to stimulate a viewer's brain? So the easy answer is, well, red is a stimulating color. It stimulates the appetite, um, but color is not that easy. Um, and especially because if everybody had red rooms that they were working in, it would also just become really generic, right? Very so the gray, <laughs> <laughs> the red room. <laughs> what we need is to figure out a what color would we enjoy working in, 
right? And because that is honestly the number one thing to your work environment and people will respond to your authentic pleasure. And so if you're in a room where you're like, I, it's yellow and I hate yellow, they're going to feel that. Maybe they won't know they're feeling it, but it does take away from your joy, which takes away from the entire experience. So first of all, what color do you like? Number two, um, what color is going to support your brand? Ideally, those are going together because okay. you're creating a brand that you want to embody. Okay. Go next branding then. <laughs> right. And then number three is related to branding. What is, what is everybody else doing and how can you set yourself apart? So if you were to scan all the cameras, you know, does everybody, does it kind of look like a whitewashed wall or is there a bunch of red or is there a bunch of blue? What could you do with your environment to help you stand out? Because obviously you're, you're physically going to be different. Your clothes are going to be different, but your environment can also be part of that. Huh? Wait, what, what was that? Why was that different? And it will catch somebody's attention. Okay. So color psychology has its place. Red, yellow, and orange stimulate appetite. They stimulate the eyes. Blues, greens, and purples are calmer, quieter colors. But those are just really blanket statements. How light or how dark those colors are, like the navy that's behind you, that's a rich, um, intense, passionate color, even though it's technically in the calm blue family. Mm -hmm. So study up on it a little bit, but please come back to what do you want to work in. And just to compliment you on your background there, what I love about what I'm seeing in your room is that it isn't distracting, right? It's crisp, it looks on purpose, it's bold, but it's not taking away my attention from what the purpose of this experience is, which is for me to look at you. Mm -hmm. And that is perfect. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not gonna turn the camera around, right? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, the camera only faces one way. All you got to do is control one angle. <laughs> Just this little area right back here. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been such an informative, I mean, for me especially too, like this has been such a very helpful segment. Um, if people want to uh, follow you, where could they find you online to get more information? I am on Instagram at Be Seriously Happy. And that's spelled out B E seriously happy. And I am also, well, my design company is seriouslyhappyhomes.com. And the book is on Amazon, Happy Starts at Home. And my business coaching is at seriouslyhappy.com. Awesome. That should be enough ways to get a hold of me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, if anyone is curious, um, after this video, they can also go to streammaterecruiting.com slash Rebecca West, and we will have all of her information there as well. Rebecca, thank you so much. I appreciate you for taking your time and all of the great info as well today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.